This is the Rational Reminder Podcast, a weekly reality check on sensible investing and financial decision-making from two Canadians. We're hosted by me, Benjamin Felix, and Cameron Passmore, Portfolio Managers at PWL Capital. Welcome to episode 295, a more traditional type episode this week. Ben, we have you with a deeper dive into an investment topic. Why don't you quickly cue that up? Yeah, we're going to talk about home country bias, the decision of whether to overweight the stocks of your home country relative to their market capitalization weights. Yeah, great uh, great topic there. Uh, Mark McGrath, our colleague, is back with a segment, Mark to Market, and this week he is talking about segregated funds, which is a popular investment among many people in Canada. So that's a good, good topic. Then we'll look back at episode 206 when Professor Vanessa Bonds joined us and that was about her book you have more influence than you think and then we have a fascinating conversation with another academic uh, todd rogers author of the book writing for busy readers communicate more effectively in the real world very interesting take on that topic from a from a scientific standpoint Mm -hmm. yeah that was a good conversation yeah anything to add ben no i think that's good all right. Lots of stuff to cover. It's a, it's a good episode, so we'll get to it. All right, let's jump to your home country bias. Okay, Ben, episode 295. Let's jump right into it. All right, let's do it. So we're talking about home country bias, which is the idea that that uh, the, the idea of overweighting the stocks of your home country relative to their market cap weights. So we know international diversification is important. That's theoretically and empirically true. But the the thing that a lot of people do in a lot of countries is overweight their home country stocks. Like there is, if you look around at countries around the world and ask, do people in that country own stocks in their home country at market cap weights? The answer is pretty much universally no. They overweight them pretty dramatically. Uh, and that's often consider, considered a mistake, whether it is or not, we'll, we'll talk more about. Uh, but, but Canada, for example, we're like 3%, roughly, yep. of the global market cap. But if you look at how much Canada Canadians have in their portfolios, it's closer to 50%. So pretty significant home country bias that Canadians exhibit. Now, we're going to talk about when home country bias can make sense. At the extremes, like 50% or 80% or something like that, uh, that's probably not great. But having some home country bias, I think, can make sense. So that's what we're going we're gonna to talk about. We're going to talk about the arguments in favor of some, some home country bias, and we're going to talk about how much home country bias uh, people might want to have. A lot of that part is going to be from a Canadian perspective. When I talk about this, on the internet, I get a lot of questions from American investors. Many of them listen to our podcast and watch my videos. Should they have a home country bias? I think a lot of the more qualitative arguments that we're going to talk about before we get to the the how much should you have, I think they apply to a, a U.S. investor too. Hmm. And I know Fama and French, uh, who are pretty smart dudes, They, I think Fama advocates for a 100% home country bias for an American investor. Yep. French, I don't know if I've seen it quantified, but I have seen him say that he has a home country bias for many of the reasons that we're going to talk about. So this is split up into kind of two chunks. We have a more qualitative piece, and then we have a more quantitative piece. The quantitative part is very, very Canadian-centric. Well, even then, there's there's some more universal evidence in there. Uh, okay. Anyway, I, I do also want to say that home country bias is one of those things like investing in gold or Bitcoin or something that people get really passionate about. It's such a kind of a random topic to get so... <laughs> no kidding. <laughs> people do get really fired up about it. I, I actually don't have a really strong opinion on home country bias. I like. I have some in my own portfolio. Our clients at PWL have a home country bias to Canadian stocks for the reasons that we're going to talk about. But if someone said I don't want a home country bias and they understood the reasons that they might want to have one, I would not argue yeah. <laughs> with them about it. Um, and I think that shows up in some of the evidence that we're going to talk about too, where it's like, it doesn't make that much of a difference, even if we can say that it's optimal. On the quantitative side, the qualitative stuff is, I think, more interesting. Anyway. I agree. Okay. So in, in just basic financial theory, start from there. 
under the capital asset pricing model, the market cap weighted portfolio is the optimal risky portfolio for all investors. Now, listeners know we could go way deeper than the CAPM. We can start talking about the ICAPM, which we actually will touch on. But just start from basic theory. Under CAPM pricing in an efficient market, everyone should just own the market portfolio. So say you should own um, whatever, the market portfolio of all, of all stocks and maybe all bonds as a starting point. Um, so that, that's from that position, we would suggest that a, a Canadian should own 3% Canadian stocks in their investment portfolio. Now, because of that, because that's what CAPM pricing suggests, um, or, or CAPM theory suggests, I guess, um, fun, fundamental portfolio, portfolio theory, it, it's often deemed a puzzle that people in Canada, for example, overweight their home country stocks, known as the home bias puzzle. And this has been documented, I don't know if it was the first paper, but I, I know Ken French and James Paterba had a paper in the early 90s, I think, on home, oh, home wow. country bias. Uh, wow. So it's been a known thing for, for a while. And I think they in, in their paper, they talked about how I did not review that paper for this episode, so I'm going from memory here, but I think in that paper they talked about how the expected returns people had to, or the returns people had to expect from their home countries had to be unrealistically high to justify the level of observed home country bias. So that was, hmm. that was their fun. Home country bias has come down since then, uh, but it is still, it is still pretty high. Like people are investing more internationally now than they were in the, in the early 90s. Uh, so a, a puzzle in financial economics can mean a couple different things. It can mean that investors are making persistent mistakes for reasons like familiarity, for example, or, or the one I just said, where they expect the returns of their home country stocks to be higher than international stocks, which could be related to familiarity. Financial literacy, like all those kinds of mistake explanations. Or it can mean that investors are doing something rational that's just not reflected in the model being used to define the puzzle. Um, so the, the CAPM, for example, makes lots of assumptions that we know don't reflect the real world. It doesn't typically account for costs and taxes. Uh, it ignores how the financial market portfolio interacts with other stuff, like the cost of you know buying groceries in your specific country. And it's silent on how the treatment of foreign investors during times of geopolitical crisis can affect investment outcomes. That's just not in the, the CAPM okay. or in any asset pricing model, really. Now, in Canada, on costs, the fees on a Canadian equity ETF tend to be quite a bit lower than the fees to own international developed, not so much U.S. stocks. You can get a U.S. equity ETF for about the same as a Canadian ETF in Canada. Um, but international tend to be quite a lot more expensive in emerging markets, even even more so. But then another big one on cost of ownership is that in Canada, if you're an investor receiving dividends from a Canadian corporation, you actually get credit for the taxes that the corporation has paid. So we have this whole complicated dividend uh, tax credit, uh, gross up and credit system. But it's all, all designed to give investors in Canada credit for tax that corporations have paid when they receive a dividend from that corporation. Now, on the other hand, if you're a Canadian or someone investing uh, resident in Canada and you're receiving a dividend from a foreign corporation, you don't get any credit for the taxes that corporation yep. has paid. So that increases the, uh, the, the that not getting credit for foreign uh, company taxes paid increases the relative tax cost of owning foreign stocks for Canadian investors. So all else equal, if we just assume same expected returns for foreign and domestic stocks, for example, the favorable costs and taxes make it more attractive to own Canadian stocks for a Canadian. Maybe not enough to explain the 50% uh, weight to Canadian stocks that we see from Canadian investors, uh, but that's why we're going to talk about some more of the reasons that a home bias might make sense. Um, so I, I mentioned the ICAPM earlier. So we have the CAPM, kind of the first asset pricing model, and then we have the ICAPM, the Intertemporal Capital Asset Pricing Model that Robert Merton introduced. You can hear him talk about that in his episode if, if you want. Uh, but the ICAPM talks about how investors don't only care about how their portfolio behaves in a vacuum. 
They care about how it behaves relative to other stuff that matters to them, like buying poutine. <laughs> <laughs> I, li- I like to buy poutine occasionally. I haven't had a poutine in a while, actually, but anyway. <laughs> don't want to get don't want to get too off topic here, um, but but in, in in all in all seriousness though, with something that is uniquely Canadian or uh, yeah, I guess that's a good way to explain it. Could be poutine, could be maple syrup, could be um, I don't know what else. What else is very Canadian? <laughs> beaver tails. I don't know. Okay, sure, beaver tails. Um, so to, but to, to to the extent that that Canadian companies are producing cash flows that provide better protection against changes in the prices of local goods that that people in Canada care about, that they they want to be able to purchase, some home country bias could make sense. So that's that's an ICAPM point on home country bias. Now, to to the extent that is true, I, I think some of the evidence that we'll talk about later does suggest that there is a bit of a relationship there, that when well, I'll, I'll talk about that when we get there. Uh, now, a, a, a less often discussed problem, and th- this is one that I say less often discussed because I honestly hadn't really heard about it discussed in any serious way until we had uh, Professor Eugene Fama on Rash Reminder, and he talked about this. Um, the, the treatment of foreign investors in times of, of crisis can be not so great and that can affect investment outcomes for someone who is internationally diversified. International diversification looks great when things are going well and global capital markets are free and open, at which they largely are today. But major world events like wars can cause markets to really close up and it can cause foreign investors to, to get treated quite poorly. And this is something that has happened before and has happened recently as well. Um, but if we look back, Will, Will uh, Getzman, who's another past guest, has a great paper on the history of financial markets and how they used to be very open in the early 1900s. Uh, lots of countries had active financial markets and, and European investors were being encouraged in popular books to diversify their portfolios internationally. It's like kind of funny to, to think about, I guess, but people were saying the same kind of stuff then that they're, that they're saying now. Um, and people were writing investment books then as well. Uh, But French, British, and and German investors, they did export huge amounts of capital in the early 1900s in search of returns and diversification through international uh, cross-border investments. But then starting with World War I, global financial markets started to contract, and between market closures, foreign exchange restrictions, and at the extreme, nationalizations, foreign investors experienced a lack of access to their investments and the potential for either meaningful or total losses on their international investments. Now, I mentioned that is not a, an, only an artifact of very long ago history. It's happened recently. Uh, Argentina instituted restrictions on the flow of capital in 2019, and Russia put restrictions in place in 2022 that affected the ability of investors in deemed unfriendly countries to transact in the shares of Russian companies. Uh, of, of course, you wouldn't have those problems in, or you would not tend to have those problems in, in domestic stocks. Uh, investors in Russia also had issues, apparently. I did not know this one, but uh, someone in my YouTube comments said that they're not living in Russia, but they're Russian. Uh, and they had had a similar experience where, and I did double check to make sure that these sanctions were actually real. It wasn't just a person saying random stuff on YouTube. Uh, but they said that their experience was that the EU sanctioned the Russian National Settlement Depository, the NSD, which blocked the relationship between the NSD and EuroClear and EuroStream. So people in Russia couldn't tra- can't transact in foreign securities while those wow. sanctions are in place. Wow. Yeah. So it went both ways on that one, I guess. Um, so that's a that's an interesting one, and we I, I have a clip of uh, of Fama from when he was on that we can maybe play. And the problem is, <laughs> nobody cares about investors. <laughs> investors get expropriated, and it, so you know each side always expropriates the other side's investors, but they don't fix it after the war. <laughs> it stays expropriated. 
even if you win. So uh, that, that's the risk of international uh, investing. And it's not gone. It's not gone. Uh, one other point that I think is worth considering is that, is that people care a lot about their relative economic standing. There's lots of evidence on, on this. So given the fact that a lot of Canadians do have a home country bias, we know that empirically, if you're the one person that doesn't have a home country bias and Canadian stocks are doing really well over a period of time, that could be a psychological challenge. It was not that long ago, uh, kind of before my time a little bit, um, in this industry at least, but it was not that long ago that Canadian investors had to be convinced to invest outside of Canada because Canadian stocks had done so well over a reasonably long period of time and the Canadian dollar had been appreciating, which made the returns of foreign stocks look that much worse. So, yeah. yeah it's funny. I remember in the, uh, the late 90s when all the tech boom was going on and the U.S. stocks were doing so well and if I'm remembering correctly, the Canadian dollar fell, so that was like another boost to the returns of foreign investments. So it was, a, it was a wild time. So I remember working very hard because back then in RSPs, you had a cap of, I think, 16%, then I went up to 18% of your RSP, and then 20% could be in foreign content. And then we learned that if you put a little bit of money into a labor-sponsored investment fund, you could double that. So I remember aggressively doing this to all the RSPs to get so much foreign content during that time. But, hmm. but you're right, Ben, through the years, like you go through periods where U.S. outperformed, Canada outperformed, Canadian dollar was strong, Canadian dollar was weak, so you get this, this whipsaw effect where you get this recency bias going on. Um, so, yeah, very interesting to see this, these uh, shifts through the years. Hmm. But the returns, yeah. like, in the 90s was nuts when you look at it in Canadian dollars. It was just unbelievable. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I, I, when I, in my video on this, I put a chart in there of... of Canadian stocks over that period relative to the to world stocks. It was crazy. Yep. Canada was just incredible for a, for a period of time. Uh, okay. So I, I, those were all fairly qualitative points, I think. Um, and they, they are important to consider. And then they have potentially, some of them, quantitative consequences. Um, but I, I think it's also kind of interesting although arguably less meaningful, but still really interesting uh, to look at just a purely quantitative perspective. What do the data say on home country, uh, on home country bias? And I, th this, this evidence is weak. Like this is not conclusive evidence, but it, it is interesting. And there are multiple observations that, uh, that we'll talk about. So the recent paper that Scott Cedarberg co-authored on life cycle investing they did find a, in a large sample of developed markets from 1890 to 2019 that a 35% allocation to domestic country stocks was optimal in their in their sample. So they found that the an, an all stock portfolio was pretty good over the life cycle in the main specification of their paper, and uh, within that, being 35% in domestic stocks was optimal, not by a ton. Um, right. They, they looked at domestic allocations from 5% up to 100%, and they were measuring the utility of retirement consumption and the utility of bequest. And the way that they compared the different asset allocations is by asking from a baseline level, how much more or less would you have to save to achieve the same utility if your asset allocation was different? So using that comparison, they found that 35% was optimal, but again, not by, not by a ton. Al although being 100% domestic was real bad. Yep. Like that did see significant deterioration, but between, for example, 5% and 35% domestic, not a big deal. But in any case, they do find that some home country bias seemed to be uh, useful, but keeping in mind that they're relatively small differences, I, I would say that there's a level of reasonableness and preference. And keeping in mind that my opinion on home bias is not super strong anyway. <laughs> if someone said that they didn't want it or, or wanted to be 2% of their home country relative to a 0.5% weight or no home country bias doesn't, doesn't bother me. Uh, but anyway, that paper does suggest some home country bias does make sense. And the obser observed reason, and again, this is purely empirical, but the observed reason for that finding was that when a market does well over the long run, it's common for it to have currency appreciation relative to foreign currencies 
yep. and stock part, stock market appreciation at the same time. Makes sense. Right. So when your local currency appreciates relative to foreign currencies, like you said earlier with the Canada example, Cameron, your local returns on foreign stocks are going to be lower. And if domestic stocks do well during, during those periods, it's going to help make up for the weaker return on foreign stocks. And that's their, their empirical observation in their sample. In Scott Cedarberg example, was that domestic stock returns are better than international stock returns in periods where your domestic currency appreciates over the long run. So how how much that predicts the future, I don't know, but that's their that's their observation. Uh, and, and also that that thirty five percent uh, domestic allocation does not account for the more favorable costs and taxes when you're investing domestically. So that uh, if they had that in their model, that would presumably increase somewhat the domestic allocation. Uh, and then on the quantitative side, there are two more weaker, weaker than that <laughs> empirical observations, but I'll still, I'll still talk about them. So Vanguard had a paper a while ago where they looked at a, a minimum variance analysis for Canadian investors. So they incrementally added Canadian stocks to a global equity portfolio and found the point of least return variance over the period 1999 through 2023. And they found a 30% allocation to Canadian stocks was optimal for variance minimization. And they do have asset allocation ETFs with a 30% weight to Canadian stocks. <laughs> um, and then I, when I was preparing this video, I've got the, the Dimson Marsh Staunton data set. And so whenever I have uh, something like this that I want to check out, I, if I can, I'll try and run it in, in those data. So I took the Canadian dollar real returns for uh, global portfolios with various allocations to Canadian stocks. And this is for 1900 through 2022. Okay. And so I'm, again, incrementally adding Canadian stocks to the portfolio. And I was looking at, in this case, risk-adjusted returns. And I found somewhere between 30 and 40% was kind of the, uh, the highest sharp ratio of hmm. those portfolios. So again, kind of interesting, but also, you know, it's data, but it's pretty anecdotal, but still interesting. <laughs> Uh, and it matches up with, with uh, the Cedarberg finding and with the Vanguard findings. I don't know. All kind of points generally in the same direction. But I, I, I caution is definitely warranted, though, with findings like Vanguard's and mine and Scott's because they're purely, purely empirical. They're specific to the time periods that we're looking at, although the bootstrap approach that Scott uses, Scott and his co-authors use, is trying to deal with that a little bit. But at the end of the day, they're all purely empirical observations. And if, if in my analysis I didn't do this, but if I would used a country other than Canada, like, like Italy, for example, which has had pretty bad equity returns, um, it probably would have been a much lower allocation that would have made sense, I'm guessing. It's true. Yeah. Yeah. But can Canada is, you know, one of the best-performing country markets uh, going back to 1900. One of the better ones, at least. Uh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, g given all that, though, we talked about the qualitative piece. We talked about the weak but interesting quantitative piece. Taken all together, we talked about the ICAP M piece. Uh, so, take it all together. I think there are pretty good theoretical on the ICAP M side, practical on the tax and cost side, and empirical that we just talked about arguments for having some level of home country bias in equity portfolios. Um, one common concern with that when you're overweighting a, a small market like Canada, small by market cap, is that it may have low realized returns. I understand that concern completely. Uh, but empirically, there's, there's a couple papers on this. Um, the stock returns of smaller countries where size is measured by market cap of the country tend to be quite a bit higher than larger countries on average. So you could still have an outlier that does poorly, but on average, smaller markets tend to do better. Uh, that's from a 2017 paper in the Journal of Portfolio Management. Should you tilt your equity portfolio to smaller countries? But there was another one uh, in the Journal of Investing, I think. The small, yeah, there it is. The small country effect revisited. Similar stuff. I mean, similar data, so not a materially different paper. But m people have looked at this, and uh, small countries tend to do tend to do pretty well. So uh, just 
worth worth keeping in mind when when you're concerned about well this small country might might do poorly in the long run which could still happen um which is why we don't go 100 percent domestic <laughs> but but I also, I also don't think it's a reason to completely eliminate home country bias given all the other stuff that we've talked about uh, another common one and this is coming up for canada right now is that you know insert country canada in this case has really poor economic prospects um there's a article in the Globe Mail that kind of skewered Canada for for its economic situation and, and related that back to its its stock returns. Um, but I think we always have to remember that that relationship between economic growth in a country and, and realized stock returns is much weaker than people imagine it to be. Yes. It's somewhere between unrelated and negatively related, depending on how statistically significant we want to be with making that statement. The reason being that expected economic growth is reflected in current stock prices. So rather than stock returns being tied to economic growth, they're tied to how actual economic growth compares to expected economic growth, which is a super noisy, um, arguably even random uh, relationship. Uh, and then one of the thing, one of the point on this, on country specific risk, I guess, is that the economy is pretty global. Like a lot of companies in a lot of stock markets around the world derive a lot of their revenue and it varies from country to country but they derive a lot of their revenue from foreign countries like you've got multinational businesses in countries all over the world that are deriving large portions of the revenue from uh, markets outside of their home country so no country is really a, an economic island although I, in my youtube video on this i said no country is an island and then people from countries that are literal islands said <laughs> well actually <laughs> no country is an economic island um, <laughs> that's pretty funny. Yeah, <laughs> I, I don't know. That's funny. Um, you can't get away with anything, can you? <laughs> no, no. Everything's scrutinized. Uh, so for, foreign revenues don't explain all of local stock returns, which is one of the reasons that we still diversify globally despite the existence of multinationals. I talked about that in my video on international diversification. Um, but foreign revenues do explain a meaningful portion of domestic market returns. So a country's stock market is affected by more than its domestic economy. Uh, now, economic prospects aside, investors in some countries, including Canada, may be concerned that there are just too few companies for their market to deliver a reliably positive risk premium. I thought that was interesting to think about. So I went and looked at the MSCI uh, developed market indexes going back to 1970. And I looked at the number of holdings in the indexes, which would have varied over time. So to be clear, I, I looked at the current number of holdings in the indexes and just assumed that that was somewhat consistent over time and compared that or just charted that against historical returns. There's no relationship at all. And like Denmark, which is the best performing developed market from 1970 to now, has 16 holdings. In its, uh, wow. in its index. Yeah. And that's not its investment market index. So the investment market would have more, like if you include small caps. Yep. That's just its uh, like large and mid cap index. But still, 16 holdings, best performing market. And if you look at the chart that I did on this, uh, which is what was in my, my video, there's just no, no observable relationship. Um, and in Canada has, you know, more than 16 companies in, uh, in, in, in our main index. Uh, okay, so home country bias, which is overweighting your home country's stocks relative to their market capitalization weights, is, is detrimental at the extremes. I think that should just be kind of common sense obvious. But some modest home country bias, I think we can say is theoretically, practically, and empirically justified or or useful it can reduce fees and taxes it may hedge the cost of local consumption and it reduces exposure to the potential mistreatment of foreign investors through times of geopolitical turbulence which we have lived through very recently and it may also help psychologically due to the role of social comparison in determining exactly. individual happiness uh, and then if we look to the the weak but fun empirical stuff um, for Canada, or for a developed market, I guess, if you look at the Cedarburg paper, for Canada, if you look at the Vanguard 
and my analysis with the DMS data, um, something like 30%, 35% in domestic stocks, Canadian domestic stocks. Well, I keep saying Canada, but the Cedarburg paper is not about Canada. It's about a representative exactly. developed market. Yep. Yep. Uh, so that 35% number comes up in all three of those um, analyses, but even lower domestic allocations, uh, like 5%, for example, which still represent a home bias for investors outside the U.S., have been better empirically, again, based on the Cedarburg paper, than no home bias at all. I think this is a very reasonable and reasoned take on it. So I agree with you. Uh, I mean, and you know, always got to be careful. Like we're coming from the position of doing this for clients and having that in my personal portfolio because I think it makes sense. <laughs> but yeah. but I am talking about it from that position. So maybe I'm maybe I'm biased. Um, but again, I I wouldn't feel too strongly about someone saying they they don't want a, a home country Sorry. bias to yep. Canada. I would maybe say that's not going to be as tax efficient, but no problem. All right, that was awesome. You ready to go over to our conversation with uh, my buddy Mark? Let's go. All right, let's kick off our Mark to Market segment. Mark, welcome back to the podcast. Thank you. Always a pleasure <laughs> to be here. So what so do we got? What do we You guys what are, are so we formal. Today? It's so funny. That's right. <laughs> serious. Serious business podcast, here only. Cameron, it's, it is serious. It's very serious, yes. I was going to talk about Bitcoin. I pitched that to Ben. And uh, Ben's in the middle of reading some books that I had recommended him on the topic. And I think so far, so far his reviews are not, <laughs> not that good. So it, uh, my, my, my intermediate review, yeah. I, I've got to yeah. finish the book. You've got, I you've think got to read some books I sent you too, though. I do. I do. I've got a long reading list ahead of me. But uh, I think it would just be fun because I'm sure you would just eviscerate me and my views on the topic anyway. And I think it would be fun <laughs> for the listeners to, uh, to watch that smackdown happen in, in real time. I don't but know no. if that's completely true. You, you can't argue against a $63,000 or whatever it is Bitcoin price. What's the counter argument to that? That's kind of know. a joke. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> but yeah, not going to make it. Have fun staying poor. I don't know. Yeah, all that. All that good stuff. Um, so no, so I'm not going to talk about Bitcoin today. We'll, we'll hold off for potentially a future episode. But I, I am going to talk about uh, something called segregated funds or seg funds as they're, as they're known. And... Um, these are interesting products, I would say. There's a lot of nuance to them. They're actually somewhat deceptively complicated. Like on the surface, they seem kind of simple, but as you kind of dig into them, they're, they're quite complex. So I thought I'd go through kind of what they are, what the purported benefits are, some of the drawbacks, <clears throat> and then some of the issues I see with, with seg funds, good, good and bad, but um, some of the issues with the way I think that they're sold and some of the purported benefits and why they may not be as strong as um, some proponents would lead us to believe. So with that, segregated funds are sometimes called GIFs, GIFs, Guaranteed Income Funds. That term is mostly interchangeable from, from what I can tell, uh, but we'll call them seg funds for, for this segment. And basically what they are is just, they're a mutual fund with a wrapper, an insurance wrapper around them. And so the way I think about them is this was kind of the insurance industry's solution to how do we sell investment products, right? And so they've created this sort of hybrid product that acts in a lot of ways like an investment, like you participate in the growth or lack of growth of the underlying investment. So you can get seg funds that have their Canadian equity or Canadian dividend funds or global equity funds or fixed income or whatever you want. And they have this insurance component to it. And the insurance component has a couple of different pieces. And so there's what we call maturity guarantees and death benefit guarantees. I'll get into those a, a little bit more, but these are kind of in the, the actual insurance component to the segregated fund, where after a certain period of time, if the value of that fund is lower than X after say 10 years, you actually get the higher of whatever the market value is or whatever the guaranteed amount was. So again, I'll get into that in a little bit more detail shortly. Uh, they're usually actively managed. So they're you know, professionally managed, but they're usually done in a way that is like tactical management. So getting in and out of different markets or, you know, a lot of stock picking and selecting securities within the underlying fund. Uh, so I couldn't really find any like index fund variations. There are ETFs that are kind of marketed as the solution to this, you know, boom in ETFs that we're seeing. But when I looked at underneath the surface, these are actually just actively managed ETFs with the insurance wrapper. So from what I can tell, there's not really a, a big market for index fund mm. seg funds, at least not yet. And, and granted, I didn't, I mean, 
there's thousands of these things out there. They're sold by insurance companies. And I didn't go through every single one, but in my preliminary search for it, I couldn't find any real index fund solutions for it. Uh, as I mentioned, they provide these maturity guarantees, and that means you can also name a beneficiary. That's kind of the other side of this insurance piece, is you can name a beneficiary and the funds on your death, the, the value of that seg fund would pass directly to a beneficiary outside of your estate. We'll talk about that a little bit. And as of 2021, there was $130 billion in segregated funds in, mm. in Canada. And I couldn't find an updated figure. So that's 2021 figures. But as of 2023, there was about two, just over $2 trillion in mutual funds and ETFs. And so the seg fund market, you know, if you assume a couple percent growth on the seg fund market over the past couple of years, it's probably between like 7 to 10% of the Canadian investment universe right now, which is, I don't know if that's higher or lower than I thought it would be. Um, I think I could probably make the argument that it's too high based on the applications of these things, but um, it's, it's a pretty big market and it, and it does hmm. seem to be growing. So the, the benefits, the, the proposed benefits are, I'd, I'd say there's three. There's those maturity guarantees, there's the probate planning, and then there's potentially creditor protection, which I think is potentially a weak argument. But let's start with the guarantees. So with seg funds, there's two guarantees. There's a maturity guarantee, and that's based on a timeline for you holding the fund. It's usually 10 years, but it can go up to 15 years, it looks like. And then there's a death benefit guarantee. And each of these guarantees is offered as a percentage of the principal value of your investment. More commonly, it's 75%. And sometimes there's more expensive versions that will be 75% for the maturity guarantee and 100% for the death benefit guarantee. And so what this means is if you put $10,000 into a seg fund, after 10 years, if the market value of that seg fund has dropped by more than 25%, then at that 10 year maturity date, you'll get the higher of the market value or that reset value. So if it's 50% lower after 10 years, you'll actually get it bumped up to whatever that maturity guarantee was 75%. Okay. The death benefit operates in a very similar way where if you pass away that 75% or in some cases, hundred percent, it gets bumped up to that value. Interestingly though, if you purchase after age 80, these things usually go to only a 75% guarantee. Or like you can, you can imagine a situation where an 89 year old is, you know, potentially has a very, very short lifespan and they've got a million dollar portfolio and they just throw it into the seg funds. They're not going to get a hundred percent guarantee. They're going to get a 75% guarantee. Right. That guarantee is in my opinion, largely useless, right? I mean, if you have a, uh, there, there are very few periods historically, I think, where after 10 years of a reasonably well-diversified portfolio, you would be down by more than 25% on your investment, right? And in fact, and I said this on Twitter a while back, I think one of the reasons that the guarantee is important is because the fees on these things are so high that the probability of you losing money in a seg fund is actually much higher than the alternative, only as a result of the fees that these things charge, right? And we'll get into the fees in a minute because they're, they're egregious. And you but can't I think get that into, uh, sorry to interrupt, but you can't get into focus yeah. funds anymore, right? Because I know back in the day, we had one client that owned a NASDAQ 100 fund that mm. actually went down by three quarters. And yeah. we waited out the insurance company a decade. Like I locked in. March 23rd, 2000, at something like 30 cents on the dollar. And we just wow. waited the decade. And it never came anywhere close to what they ended up recovering, which was 100 cents on the dollar. But it was, so a, it was, it was a focus fund. I think the rules changed after that. To, you have to be more diversified in these portfolios. There, there are, <clears throat> I don't know if I'd call them sector funds or anything like that. I mean, but there's, there's a lot of options, right? Like again, there's, you know, Canadian dividend funds only there's us equity funds, there's balance funds, fixed income funds, global equity. There's, so there's a lot of options out there for sure. Um, the marketplace is pretty wide in that respect. I didn't see anything that specifically track one index. So maybe those are harder to come by these days, but Cameron, to your point, that's actually in practice, one of the few potential times where I think one of these might've made sense. But you, you won't know that going into it, right? right? I mean, if we could all predict the next tech crash, I think uh, I think yeah. we'd all be we'd all be doing pretty well at the end of the day. So there, there sure there would be maybe periods historically where these things would have played out, but the opportunity cost by paying these additional fees in anticipation of something like that, I think is too expensive. And because that reset is ten years long now, or potentially fifteen years, again, there's there's just going to be so few periods where that's going to be a problem. And if the if the the guarantee is only 75%. It's not that you just have to break even after the 10 years, you still have to be down by 25%. Right. And I just think that's very rare. Yep. So, so those guarantees I think are largely good marketing gimmick, but in practice are not really going to be uh, a real benefit except for in very fringe edge cases. 
Now, one thing that I think is actually a reasonable benefit is the the bypassing of probate. So there's kind of, I guess, two components to that. One is in some provinces we have probate fees. So in Ontario, I think it's pretty much more or less 1.5%. In BC where I am, it's call it 1.4%. In some provinces, this is a flat fee. Like Alberta, it's super cheap. It's a flat fee. So in many provinces, this is not actually going to be a benefit. Mm-hmm. But you can bypass the probate process, meaning you bypass the probate fees on the value of that seg fund when you pass away. But I think more importantly, you bypass the entire probate process, right? Like probate, you know, for all of us advisors out there, if we've been through a, a client passing away or a family member, if you've ever been through that process, it's it's awful. It's a nightmare. It takes a long time. It can be expensive if you have executors that are charging fees because they're allowed to charge fees. Yep. Lawyers are getting involved. They're charging fees. So bypassing that whole process, I think, is a reasonable benefit. The problem is, again, the fees that you pay for that benefit are very high compared to the alternatives. So unless you know that death is imminent, you're likely going to be paying too much for the, for that potential benefit. It can also be pretty messy to bypass probate right like that can lead yep. to all sorts of other unintended consequences like probate i've heard some estate planning lawyers say that paying the probate fee is actually not so bad relative yep. to the i mean the benefits of probate making sure the estate is settled properly and fairly yeah because you can end up with unequal distributions in the Sorry. estate right if you have some assets that have a named beneficiary like life insurance rsps tfsas and say seg funds some assets that don't say your home or a rental property or a non-registered portfolio you now have to balance the direct payment of the 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 funds that have beneficiaries attached with what the will is going to do to distribute so you can accidentally or inadvertently end up with unequal distributions um, and that may not be ideal. So to your point, Ben, I think there's many cases where we recommend like the estate just take over as the beneficiary. Everything goes into the estate. <clears throat> the will determines where the money's, money goes, the taxes get paid. Mm-hmm. And it's very clear. It's very simple. But interestingly, probate or, or estates rather are public information now. Like you can go and look up the record of somebody's estate. So with the SEG fund, because it bypasses probate, there's an element of privacy to it, right? Now, again, I would argue that <clears throat> privacy is likely only a real feature for those who have relatively large estates like i just and family dynamics come into this obviously but if you have a relatively small estate that privacy probably isn't worth much it's probably for something like a big estate and if you have a big estate i think there are better estate planning alternatives like using things like alter ego trusts right. and joint partner trusts which maybe we can talk about on a different episode but with large estates there's better in my opinion estate planning that can be done if privacy is the goal or if the expediency of uh of probate and estate planning is, is the goal mm-hmm. So again, you're going to pay a lot of fees for those. Now, the third potential benefit is creditor protection. And so because it's an insurance contract at the end of the day, these are protected from creditors. Um, I, I don't know, like maybe for business owners who don't have a corporation, who run a sole proprietorship, who need some level of liability protection, maybe there's an argument there. I'm kind of reaching, but I don't know that the creditor protection is something that is worth paying all of these extra fees for when... You could have just you know good liability insurance or a corporation that can protect right. you from liability. So again, these are kind of fringe benefits that I think are used to sell the products. But at the end of the day, it, look, and it's case by case. I, I'm not saying there are never times where something like this would make sense. I'm just struggling to come up with like an ideal scenario where it's just obvious that this is the solution to that problem. So those are mostly the benefits. Oh, the other one that's, that's um, there's, there's two other ones actually I missed. One is simpler tax reporting which, okay, sure. So they, they take care of the adjusted cost basis for you. You don't have to calculate that yourself. Okay. Not really a big deal, I think, for most people, but at the end of the day, that is true. And then the other one is you can reset these features. So you can lock in your gains. So let's yeah. say you've got $100,000 in a seg fund. It goes up to 150000 after three years. You can lock in that gain, but then it also resets that maturity deadline. So it pushes the maturity deadline out to another 10 years. So in my mind, this is no different than just buying a brand new seg fund at $150,000, right? It's no different than selling your portfolio and just buying a new one. So it, it, like if it didn't reset the maturity guarantee, I could see these locking in of gains being great, but that's that's not the case. So again, kind of a fringe benefit there. Hmm. Okay, so those are the benefits. Some of the drawbacks. Um, one, these are insurance products, so they can only be sold by insurance licensed advisors. That in itself is not bad, but what I've seen in practice, and you guys have probably seen as well, is because this was really, I think, the answer to 
the insurance industry trying to find a way to sell investment products, you end up with a lot of insurance only advisors who can only use segregated funds for clients. I know, for example, an advisor used to work with you know, 10, 12 years ago that had hundreds of millions of dollars of seg funds in his client portfolio because he was only insurance licensed. And I think it's very hard to make the argument that statistically, I just happened to have all of these people who needed <laughs> segregated funds as, as clients, right? So I think it's one of those, when you're a hammer, everything's a nail type situations. They can't sell anything else. So they end up selling seg funds, which it is what it is, but I think they're, they're oversold for that reason. Um, probably the biggest problem is the fees. So the average segregated fund fee in Canada for a 75% guarantee is 2.92%. Hmm. Now these are what well, well, I'll use a class fund comparisons. Yeah. So for those who don't know an a class is basically there's a trailer fee inside it, but to make an apples to apples comparison, if you were to just buy this off the street, essentially the average fee is 2.92%. For a hundred percent guarantee, the average is 3.27%. Hmm. This comes from Morningstar from an article, from, um, I think about a couple years ago where they looked at this. But if you compare that to the average balanced mutual fund, in Canada, the fee is 2.3%, which is still ridiculously high. But at the end of the day, these things are, you know, half a percent to a percent more expensive. And the reason is because they have to add an insurance fee to For the sure. management expense ratio, right? So to the annual yeah. fee you pay, there's actually an additional fee called the insurance fee. And that usually ranges from between 0.25% to 0.5%. So you're, you're automatically going to be paying more for the equivalent seg fund than you would a mutual fund. But on top of that, they have to pay f uh, taxes within the fund on that additional insurance fee. So because the base fee is higher and taxes are applied to it, that pushes it up another couple points, right? So they're very, very expensive. And I mean, if you look at A-class index funds, you can get those for you know 1.2 to say 1.5%. So often you're paying between two and a half to, or between two and say two and a half times more for some of these benefits that I mentioned. Hmm. If you compound that over long <laughs> periods of time, the effect is substantial to say the least right so you have to think are these potential benefits of seg funds really worth this significant increased cost yeah the cost compound and the, and some of the benefits like the guarantees like you mentioned earlier they diminish in terms of any any benefit because over yeah. 10 years you're very unlikely to lose in any equity fund even if it has a three percent fee yeah. And even, and even, yeah, exactly. And even then, if you're paying the extra 1% per year for that benefit, even if it's lower at the end of the day, you still have to right. overcome the, the fee as well. So the fee itself right. impacts why that guarantee I think is actually reasonable because the fees are so high that it improves the probability that you're actually going to lose money on this thing over the long run. Um, there's a lot of complexity behind some of the other benefits or, or, or features of these things like there's income for life type variations where at a certain point you can convert it basically into an annuity, which is, which is cool. Like I, I think annuities are, are great. I think they're underused to be honest, but I went and took a look at one series of these income annuity or sorry, income seg funds versus comparable annuity quotes today. And the seg fund version comes in around half a percent lower per year in terms of the return you would get using a seg fund versus actually just going and buying an annuity for like a 65 year old male, for example. So you, you still, it's expensive and it, it's an expensive way, I think, to annuitize your income when other options are available. Um, one of the other issues that I found was the, the, um, I guess insurance or protection of your investment. And what I mean by that is if the insurance company that you've bought in the seg fund through fails in any way, the insurance is provided by a company called Assurus in Canada, they protect insurance contracts and that. With investments, we have something called the Canadian Investor Protection Fund, which protects you up to a million dollars in certain cases, not against market losses, but against the insolvency of the fund. Um, but assure us the guarantees on SEG funds are significantly lower than what you would get from the Canadian Investor Protection Fund. So assure us only guarantees you up to $100,000 per SEG fund or 90% of the guarantee value, whichever is higher. So what that means, if you have, say, $150,000 SEG fund with a 75% guarantee. That 75% works out to $112,000. And 
And Assurus is only going to protect you for 90% of that. So it's not 90% of the value, but 90% of the guaranteed amount, mm. which means on a $150,000 seg fund, you're actually only protected in that case for about $101,000 in the insolvency of the insurance company, which granted is you know very unlikely. But those protections are lower from what I can find than something like the CIPF, the Canadian Investor Protection Fund. So there's some risk there. Um, I think there's alternatives that are more appropriate in the case where you have a large estate. I mentioned things like alter ego trusts, joint partner trusts. These are estate planning tools. There's some complexity there, no doubt. But I think on a large enough estate, the cost of implementing that is significantly lower than the additional fee that you would pay for a segregated fund. Um, I was trying to come up with like scenarios where this is just a no brainer. And at first I was like, well, yeah, if you're terminally ill with a couple of years to live and you have a million dollars in cash in the bank, sure, you could use this and it would bypass probate. But in that situation, you could also just gift the money, right? Yep. Like, you just give the money to the beneficiaries now if you know you're terminally ill and death is imminent. So I, I, I did struggle and I'm sure there's going to be people out there who use these more frequently than, than, than I do, obviously, who have good scenarios where this makes sense. But um, my takeaway was they're expensive, very few people need them, and uh, just be wary if somebody's selling them to you because there's potentially a motive there, especially if they're only insurance licensed. Will the people who have better use cases than, than you, will they be only insurance licensed? I think we both know the answer to that. <laughs> um, like when I talk about this on Twitter, inevitably, like anything I talk about on Twitter, I get on both <laughs> sides of the argument. And it becomes very clear. Uh, this happened to me just a couple of weeks ago. And this person was touting the benefits. And so I looked them up. And of course, they're an insurance only advisor. And that's that's fine. I get that. I, again, there's nothing wrong with that. But there's a lot of confirmation bias, I think, that goes into the way that these things are sold. And a more objective view where you have alternative options that you could offer to your clients. And if a seg fund is the right answer, sure, that's great. But I think in most cases, it's not. Hmm. Yep. That was great. I like your assessment's right. Yep. Great points. Fun stuff. Um, cool. So that's all I got for you today. But uh, see you see you next time. Hopefully Ben and I can fight it out over over Bitcoin one of these days. And uh, yeah, I don't know if that'll be we'll see. two two weeks. I probably need more time to finish. Yeah, finish that I'm book. Not, I'm not like super pro Bitcoin or anything, but I read a couple of books and it did answer some of the, the concerns that I had about it. So I'm a little bit more, I think, open to the viewpoint of some of the uh, the Bitcoin. Maximus you guys can today. debate and I'll, I'll moderate. How's that? <laughs> that sounds good. I'll All still right. get absolutely licked by Ben, I'm sure, but it'll be fun for everybody. Uh, I right. mean, I don't know if that's true. Like the, the thing about a lot of the arguments, like in the book that I'm reading, a lot of the arguments are deeply ideological. Yeah. And the book recognizes that to an extent, but it also uh, it also takes a a very clear position from the beginning. And builds itself, builds the builds the case toward Bitcoin from the very beginning. Of course, it's just it's kind of funny to read. Like when you know when you know where it's going to go, it's funny to read how they build up that that conclusion. Um, anyway, so it's a tough thing to debate. Yeah, because debating ideology is kind of hard. <laughs> Fair enough. We'll think about it next time. Cool. All right. <laughs> Great. Okay, guys. Thanks. Mark. Thanks. See you. Great to be back in the group with Mark. I thought that was a great segment. Let's look back on a past episode quickly. And we've had many impressive uh, academics and professors join us from the world of psychology. And episode 206 with uh, Professor Vanessa Bonds is no exception. I thought she was fantastic. She's a social psychologist and professor of organizational behavior at Cornell. And wrote the book, You Have More Influence Than You Think. So this is very important uh, to realize that most people see how others influence us. However, we also think that they have little influence on others, which is just not true. Our actions and words impact those around us and often in really subtle ways. So I remember this, this question you gave back to Vanessa Ben. As an introvert, you uh, talked about in the interview, it can be terrifying to think that we have as much influence as we do, and that we're being observed this much. However, she explained back to you and I, because we're both introverts, she explained back to us that it's not necessarily what we say in a group setting. People simply observe how we behave and how we 
treat and what we treat as important, and people take cues from that. And as she said, people often notice what we take for granted. So another fascinating point that uh, she made was how just being around other people when we experience things can actually amplify the experience. For example, people report liking art in a gallery much more when people around them are enjoying it. And then the amplification continues if they talk about it. So there's that power of, of the, the verbal cues that come with it. So if you put these two points together, which I think is so fascinating, in the context of money, you may notice people around you and how they act around money and people that you observe behaving well will have an impact on you. But then if they tell you something, that really amplifies the impact on you. And this is something you should be keenly aware of uh, when you're making decisions because it can lead to as Vanessa said, turning off your critical thinking. Such a fascinating idea. Uh, after that, we also dove into how scammers benefit from this kind of influence, how to say no, and how to ask for what you want. So that's a very quick recap of episode 206 with Vanessa Bonds and the book, You Have More Influence Than You Think. I talked to my kids about this, about the p- people notice uh, your behavior and, and they notice the stuff that you take for granted, but the other side of that is that they don't tend to notice that stuff that you were worried about them noticing. People worried about like how they look or what they're wearing, yeah, all that yeah. kind of stuff. People don't notice that stuff. Yep. But they do notice how you behave and, and whatever. So that's, yep. I talk to my kids about that when they're worried about whatever, the shirt they're wearing when they're going to school. People won't notice. They just nope. don't notice that stuff. Nobody cares. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let's jump now to our special guest. Todd Rogers is a behavioral scientist and professor of public policy at the Harvard Kennedy School of Government. He's a behavioral scientist who works to increase student attendance, strengthens democracy, and improve communication. He's also co-founded two social enterprises. First one is the Analyst Institute, which focuses on improving voter communications and also everyday labs again, to help reduce student absenteeism. At Harvard, Todd is the faculty director of the Behavioral Insights Group and faculty chair of the Executive Education Program, Behavioral Insights and Public Policy. Got his PhD from Harvard's Department of Psychology and Harvard Business School and received a BA from Williams College, majoring in both religion and psychology. He co-wrote the book, Writing for Busy Readers, Communicate More Effectively in the Real World, with Jessica Lasky-Fink, who is the research director at the People Lab at Harvard. Uh, Hal Hirschfield, once again, made this great introduction to Todd. And I thought this was absolutely fascinating to put uh, science behind how we communicate. And and off mic, you were saying something earlier, Ben, about how, which I think is so interesting, how people adapt to different communication styles. This is really an adaptive system that evolves over time. We did talk about that with uh, with Todd. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, 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 this conversation is great, but that part definitely stood out for me that, 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 like you said, people adapt to communication styles and something that was something that would get your attention previously will eventually stop getting your attention as you adapt to it. And so we always have to be finding new ways to get people's attention with our communication. Okay. Let's go to our conversation with Todd Rogers. Todd Rogers, welcome to the Rational Reminder podcast. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here. It's great uh, great to have you, and it's very nice of our good friend Hal to make the introduction. So off the top, what does science have to do with effective writing? It's actually a great question to start with because people historically and in present day think of writing as this art uh, and this this art and skill that you master and it's there's a lot of taste involved and what makes something better than something else when it comes to writing is either determined by your high school english teacher or by completely subjective like things that we'll disagree on like reasonable people will disagree and the approach that my co-author on this book writing for busy readers uh jessica lasky fink the approach that she and i take is well let's start with if we're if we're writing practically this is not about writing beautiful poetry or you know works of art this is about practical writing uh let's start with thinking about how people read and then construct how should we write from that perspective 
And so the science is how do we, how do we study? What do we know about how people read and how can we study it? And then the next part is, well, okay, so what does that mean about how we should write to make sure that we can help people read? Hmm. So what do people need to understand about the human brain in order to write effectively for a busy reader? Well, what we know from studying people is that they're busy and they tend to do a thing called satisficing, which is doing good enough, maybe the first best thing. And they're, it is a completely rational response to having too many things to do. Uh, and so what do we know about how humans behave? Humans optimize under constraints and the constraint is time and the constraint is attention. And so what they do is they do their best when there's too much information overloading them, which is like they skim. They read as fast as they can. They jump around. And uh, I, I don't want I don't want to sound uh, scary or, or offensive, but they very often just don't read what we write. <laughs> that's that's how they navigate the busy lives they have and the limited attention is they skim and they decide in every given moment is this worth more of my incredibly limited attention and time and very often their answer to that question is no what decision making process do readers go through when they receive a new communication well jessica and i break this down into a few steps first am i going to engage at all and that means like they look at it with, you know, just getting a, a, a the gist, no reading, but just visually looking at it saying, am I, am I going to deal with this right now? Let's think, let's say we're talking about email, but it could be about analyses in a report. It could be about a text message. It could be about a Slack. It could be about a proposal. Am I going to deal with this? And they look at it and then you get a taste of like, do I really want to engage with it? And, and part of that is, does it look like it's going to be hard? And we ran a, an experiment that is hardly worth reporting because it's so obvious where we show someone three lines in an email or seven paragraphs. And we're like, which would you be more likely to engage with right now? <laughs> and like literally 241 out of 242 people are like the short one, please. So like, first, do they engage? Then if they say yes, then the question is like, how intensively do they engage? Are they skimming? And one of the cool things uh, that I have learned about how people read is there's three kinds of reading. There's close reading, which is what we're taught to do in school, like very close sentence by sentence re or word by word reading. That's like the, the, I don't know, the platonic ideal of reading. Then there's skimming, which is moving pretty vigorously through, but still linear, right? Like just sort of like, it often requires bouncing backwards if you realize you missed an important thing, but it's skimming. And then the last one is scanning, which I just think is a real breakthrough for me and just labeling it. Like it is where you look and you just jump around, just like backwards, <laughs> forwards, trying to, or not just orienting, but actually just trying to like, where is the thing I'm looking for? And they're scanning. And people use all three of these reading types when reading any one thing. So first is, do they engage? If they do engage, they have to like navigate and negotiate what form of reading are they going to, what level of investment are they going to do in general, but also specifically as they navigate the document? And then finally, if they've understood it, if you're asking them to take an action, the last one is, do they take an action or not? And that's a whole other negotiation with themselves about like, do, is this going to be painful? How much time is it going to take? Am I going to have to look up new things or can it be really quick? And again, almost not a study worth running, but we still ran it. Everybody will, people are way more likely to do the thing where it's like, well, yes or no versus what do you think? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, and like, of course, like people want the easiest stuff because they're busy. Okay. So given all that, can you rip through your, your six principles of effective writing? Uh, sure. First is, uh, <laughs> what are they? The less first one is, yeah, the first is less is more, which is, fewer words, fewer ideas, fewer requests. And what the basic idea of this is that uh, if you cut words, people are, if things are shorter, people are more likely to engage and, and read. Uh, that's obvious and easy and cheap, right? Like there's a famous book by Strunk and White called The Elements of Style, yep. where he, they have a, a well-known phrase, omit 
needless words. That's obvious and great. Do it. Like instead of the reason for this is just say, because, or in order to, to, right? So like you don't lose any substance or content, just you rip through it. The second is fewer ideas. I, this is all under this heading of less is more. Fewer ideas is like every additional idea you add, the less likely someone is to read and engage. And so there, it's just a judgment call. Like the more you add, the more likely someone is to not engage or not get what you want when they skim it. And so it's just a judgment call the whole way. And it really, I like this because it reinforces the, like we, we don't even talk about as a principle, like, well, Jessica and I always referred to as principle zero. You can't write unless you know what your goal is. Like there's just no writing without, without having a purpose. Uh, often writing helps you figure out what your purpose is. It's like writing can help you clarify your thinking, but that's stage zero. Then you're writing to communicate. And when, and when you know what your purpose is, the, the more ideas you add, the more you like risk losing your reader. And the third part of that is uh, fewer requests. We've done these experiments and others have too. I love them. The more you ask someone to do, the less likely someone is to do any one of them. You mm -hmm. know, it's just like, think about it. I ask you to do three things. One, you may just get deterred and not do any. Two, you, you're going to skim it and figure out what the easiest one to do is and do that first, which may distract you or derail you from the other things. Uh, and so, you've, again, hard to write effectively. I'll even go farther and say impossible to write effectively if you don't know exactly what you're trying to achieve. That's the first one. Less is more. Um, I mean, I instead of you know continuing in monologue for the next seven minutes, you guys, I, that that's that's one of my favorites. Question yeah, I had for one. you. What advice would you give to someone when deciding when to send a message? That is a common question that the marketing world wrestles with all the time. And I think, so Jessica and I come up with in this book, Writing for Busy Readers, six principles, right? One of them was less is more, which we just talked about. And those are just true. Like I, like I really think that they are pretty close to universally true, given the constraints of you knowing what your context is. So if you're writing for an audience that has expectations, you need to write for that audience. You know, we couldn't write a book that was one page, right? It had to be 200, two, it had to look like a book. Uh, so within the constraints and the expectations, the R's are at a level that is more general. A question like timing, it really is a question of equilibrium. And so I, I, I love this example. I spent a decade, I was a, de I was a political pollster in a previous life. And I founded a think tank in Washington that is the center of data science and behavioral science for the Democratic Party on the left. Uh, we'll say progressive groups. And in 2008, Obama was running for president as a Democratic nominee in the United States and was a pioneer in online small dollar donations. And was like raised more money than anybody up to that point by like an order of magnitude, I think. So then what do you guys recall or remember or think was the most effective subject line for a fundraising email from a Barack Obama in 2000? It was famous. You'll recognize it as soon as I say it. And it was not his slogan, whatever, like um, uh, hope or something like that. It was not. I don't remember what his slogan was. Uh, no, no not, not a clue lowercase h e y <laughs> hey that wow. was the most effective subject by by a lot wow. of any subject line during the campaign lowercase h e y so like why would that be so effective it's partly effective because the only people who write you informal personal messages like that are people you know and and Again, stage one of all of it is, do you read and engage at all? And it probably got past that first filter because we thought it was my friend emailing me. And then you get to it and you're like, oh, it's my friend, Barack Obama. Um, so <laughs> so after that campaign, other inquiring campaigns and, and curious and you know people seeking alpha on campaigns decide that, that they're going to write informal subject lines. That's going to be the frontier. And it worked for a while until it didn't because everyone did it. Hmm. And then it stopped being effective. 
And it wasn't a universal law mm. of the way our vision or attention evolved that H-E-Y captures the most attention. It was the context mm. in the inbox. And so I, the, the same applies to like, when is the best time to send a message? I, you know, it could be that it's Thursday at 12 Eastern time until everyone sends their messages at Thursday at 12 Eastern time. Gotcha. And then it becomes Sunday at 2 a.m. And then eventually everybody goes there, whatever. Like it's a, that, that is not a stable equilibrium. Whereas the principles are about like, well, people are generally busy. Gotcha. And how do they navigate busy text when they're busy? Well, that's universally true. How you translate it to your writing, well, that's going to be tailored to your context. That's where your judgment and knowledge about your context is going to matter. Man, so getting people engaged with communication is like a, it's like a complex adaptive system. It's exactly, yeah, it sounds exactly right. Yeah. And, and, and like, and it's easy, even easier to understand than a complex adaptive system because we're all chasing whatever the best practice is. And then once we converge, like it's just so much, it's almost not complex because it's, it, 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 I mean, you're right. It's a complex adaptive system, but this little part is like, so obviously marketers optimizing that it, uh, right. that it becomes simple. Yeah. It's crazy to think about because you, 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 I, I, I can I've, I've seen it. You know what I mean? Like I've experienced that where something's new and oh, I'll, I'll read that email and then everyone does it and it's no longer new and you no longer open that, that email. I was, I was talking to a, um, we'll just say like a federal elected, uh, uh, um, in a federal elected, uh, politician in Washington this week. Uh, or I guess whatever today is, it was last week. I don't know what day we are. Well, I think it was last week where we were talking about donate fundraising by email, by, excuse me, by printed mail. And there is a common practice in printed mail fundraising that they send you. And I don't know if this is true in Canada. Actually, I think the election laws don't, they don't even have the same kind of norms of fundraising that we do in the United States. But there are these insane norms of like six page letters that you get asking you to donate $25. Right. And, and that we were talking about how this relates to writing for busy readers and like, shouldn't that be just like one paragraph? And it depends what your goal is. I think that those may be effective, maybe because people aren't reading them anyway. They're just a signal that we take this very seriously. And this is a, like, uh, a, a, like our platform is serious. Yeah, It could be the same paragraph over and over because no one is reading six pages anyway. I, it may just be a signal, but it just depends what your goal is. If your goal is to be read and understood, and I don't think the goal of that letter is to be read and understood. I think the goal of that letter is to send a signal saying we're worthy of your $25. Hmm. That, that's kind of like, we, we talked to somebody recently who talked about uh, was Morgan Housel, who, who wrote a very popular book, The Psychology of Money. Uh, but he, he talked about how he wrote a book more recently and, and uh, he, he was like, I, I could have written this book in whatever, a much, much shorter but you can't write a book that's less than whatever or fewer than 200 pages or whatever. You, you, you alluded to that too. Right. Yeah. And, 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 and hopefully people are buying the book to read it, but sometimes they have other purposes and like, hopefully an author is writing because they intend to be read, but sometimes they may have other goals. But, but again, you write to achieve your goal and it's really hard to, hard to write effectively. And I would even say impossible if you're unclear on your goal yeah, and the goals are, the goals are varied. Yeah, that's like, nice. in fact, in fact, think about contracts. Uh, like the terms and conditions for your cell phone or for any service, the goal there is probably obfuscation and not hmm. reading and understanding. And and the Canadian Supreme Court uh, has a has a web page I'm about to send out on my newsletter where they translate all the decisions into plain language so they are comprehensible because judicial language tends to be really esoteric and like technical. They have a whole nother page that they uh, where they rewrite their own writing so that it's accessible. You could imagine if they really wanted terms and conditions to be comprehensible, there's a lot of things they could do. I don't think they, they do. And I think it's unkind, if not even illegal. Well, so the, the principles that you, that you talked about, less is more, say, stick with that one. D does that apply in all cases? Like we just had examples now where, yeah, okay. Yeah, yes. I mean, it applies if the goal is to Re get be read and understood, oh, yeah, okay. but you may have another goal layered on top of it. So like I was working with an intelligence analyst in the CIA and his, in his, the CIA in the United States is the central intelligence agency. It's a, it's part of the intelligence apparatus in the U S and, uh, 
And in their unit, they write intelligence assessments that are 70 pages. Like that's the norm. If he comes in at 30, it's going to look a lot like he didn't do his job. Hmm. Is that like the norm is the norm. And so he's got to, he's got to conform. He can still make it easier to read, which leads us to some of the other principles. Like you can make it easy to navigate, adding headings and structure and a good introduction and make the key information obvious to pull out. If there are actions to take, making them unambiguous at the very beginning, like you can make it easier to navigate, but it's still got to be as long as it's so like less is more. If your goal is being read and understood, then it's more likely to be read and understood if it's fewer words, but you may have other goals. Okay, so st sticking with the goal of being read and understood, do the principles apply to other mediums like uh, text messages or, uh, I don't know, social media posts? We've done experiments with text messages where you go from three se two sentences to three sentences and you decrease people's likelihood of responding, even on text messages. Wow, wow. Like, but think about it. I'm holding, For those of you listening, I'm holding my cell phone. How often have you like received a text and you look at it and you're like, I'll deal with that later? <laughs> right because it's just like it's too many lot i don't need it's unclear what they're at, whatever like we all have that experience and that's just yeah. that's the shortest mode of communication we have it's not huh. it, yeah i mean everybody's busy and they're all optimizing under like very rigid constraint and the rigid constraint is so much time so much attention and too many things that we would like to do and also too many things that we would not like to do but still have to do any advice on using non-words like you know like hyperlinks or emojis yeah, I love um, uh, hyperlink. We'll talk about both, but hyperlinks. I I try the the um, way if you te watch yourself when you read, we tend to jump to hyperlinks visually, and there are some papers showing this with eye tracking because they they sort of stand out, and and it kind of stinks because we don't hyperlink just means we hyper that there's something to link to. It doesn't mean it's the most important content. And so the pro like for it to draw our attention seems like such a just wasted tool. So I try to hyperlink as few, like if, if instead of the whole title of a report that is not like, Hey, uh, Ben, you asked me about the, um, uh, American with disabilities act section eight, uh, guidelines, uh, I'll do parentheses here instead of highlighting the whole. Right. title because that's the first thing you'll see i mentioned specifically that because in the united states there's a, a, a federal rule called section eight which is that you want to make your writing able to be understood by people who use readers like who are visually impaired and so there's this, this tension with you don't you mm. want to you want the hyperlink to be self-explanatory but not consuming visual attention uh so it's a balance there uh but it's just things you have to trade off on the emoji side uh, emojis are, are incredible as long as we all understand what they mean. And I, I don't want to impute ages to either of you, uh, but the young <laughs> people today, it turns out interpret the same emojis differently than I do. And so when someone sends me a message with a smiley face at the end, I think that's like thumbs up sounds good this is a warm feeling surveys the wall street journal recently published show that like whatever this before millennials i don't know what's the youngest the the Gen zennials Z. yeah isn't there like zennials too like the the whatever the, the youngest wow. people interpret that as sarcasm oh wow like almost 180 degrees from the way i interpreted it i sent them a message with a smiley face and they're like why would you do that to me I, <laughs> I thought I was sending warm. So like it, if these emojis insert ambiguity, then they're worse than nothing. Uh, but if they, if they don't, and they, they, they may be an efficient way to convey something as long as we all agree on what they mean, but I just word of caution. Uh, it turns out that uh, I, I was teaching one time and there, and, and in the chat, the students were all putting, um, skull and crossbones I, I even now despite having i wrote about this in the book i thought that i i was confused i thought maybe there was some national emergency or something i didn't know what was going on apparently that means something is good i think i don't know that i 
I don't know. You guys are uh, now. I'm going to go the other way. You guys are young. You tell me what is yeah. what. What does that mean? I would have thought the same thing as you. I guess I'm old. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> well, if you're old, Ben, I'm really old. <laughs> yeah, that that's that's fair. Uh, I, I got an email recently, not with an emoji, but just uh, the, the interpretation thing uh, made, made me think of this. The, the, the end of the email said something along the lines of "sent with warm feelings." And it was just like such an explicit way to say that this was all said, you know, nicely and in good faith. Like, huh, that's a really interesting way to sign off an email. I mean, so it's a little bit like my goals for fashion, where I just don't want to be noticed. And I want the opening and close of my messages to be forgotten and absent them is also a problem, right? So like, I'm like, hope you're well, but now I feel, I feel like people get, or feel like that's tired. So I'm still trying to come up with something that will check the box without being noticed. I am not yet ready to close my messages with sent with warm love and affection, um, <laughs> hugs or whatever yours was. I don't a know. Hug emoji. <laughs> Maybe hug emoji I could, I could do, but I just sort of like, yeah, that, that, that is, that sounds awesome. But it is so uh, abnormal that it captures attention, such mm -hmm. that we're even talking about it. Yeah. And if that's the goal, like that, that person, you know, is is truly spreading uh, warmth, and I give them a smiley face in the way I mean it. <laughs> the good, the good smiley face. The yeah, good the kind. good, <laughs> not the not the young person smiley face. The the middle aged smiley face. Uh -huh. What about uh, what about stuff like bolding and highlighting? How does that affect a message? One of the other principles is uh, direct attention with formatting. I don't even, I think that's what we called it. And um, your listeners, I assume you have show notes. Uh, we have a, a one page PDF checklist that is just the six principles. Uh, I would love to make sure that that ends up in there just because the goal, yep. the, this, the high level goal of all this work is we want everyone to add a round of editing to everything they write, everything, where they step back and ask themselves, how do I make it easier for the reader? Because if we make it easier for the reader, we're more effective and it's kinder to them. Mm. Uh, and so the checklist is a path to making it easier. The This principle of like direct attention with formatting, people interpret bold, underline, and highlight. Bold, underline, and highlight. As the writer saying to the reader, this is the most important content in the message, in the report, in whatever, in this paragraph, whatever the unit we're, we're looking at. Bold, underline, and highlight. And so that is a real, like, it, there seems to be convergence among readers. That's what the writer means by that. And that's an incredibly powerful tool for us as writers. But it also has the side effects that are unintended, or at least unexpected, which is it licenses readers, again, who are busy with too many things to do, to not read the rest of it. Because, again, their goal is like optimizing, especially if this is not central to what they're interested in, pulling out the key info and moving on. And when we, if you, so we've done these experiments, Jessica and I, where you bold, underline, or highlight uh, one sentence and you decrease the likelihood of them reading the other sentences relative to not bolding, underlining, or highlighting anything. Oh, wow. Right? Which is just like, you they jump to that and then they move on. And so it's a really powerful tool that we just have to use judiciously. Hmm. I, I think the way the principle for that one is written is is use enough formatting, but no more. That that yeah, that sounds better than saying direct attention to formatting judiciously. That seems your your version sounds better. Uh, since it's twenty twenty four, I have to ask you this question: How do you think about the impact of AI on effective writing? I th I think a lot about it. The, so two takes. The first is we are focused on. Again, how do people read? Starting with that as the anchor, how should we write to accommodate the way people actually read? And to the extent that you want humans to read what you're writing, then, then this all applies to all of it. Who, No matter who's writing it, whether it's your large language model, you and your co-pilot, bard, anthropic, negotiating how to write, whoever's writing it, these are the principles of how people read. And so however it's produced, we want to make sure that we're making it easy for them to read to the extent that our goal is humans reading it. And that is what Jessica and I are focused on. 
And so right now, the large language models are not really trained on this approach to writing because they're trained on the data that they that they that they have, which is you know basically medium to well written text that's online and whatever other data sources they can use to train on. Easy to easy to update, and eventually they will be better at this. In the meantime, uh, with a computer science colleague of mine at Harvard, we we uh, on my website have trained a large the open AI's GPT four on the principles. And then tuned it with pre and post email examples that we manually changed. So it so we basically trained GPT-4 on the principle so to rewrite emails. Uh, and if you go to the website, we have tens of thousands of users. Like it's just so fun and awesome at it. It, it was really able to learn how to make mm -hmm. it skimmable. And then you po post your message, and then it it just sort of side by side puts it up and shows what it would look like if it was easy to skim. And uh, it has been a really good coaching and teaching tool as I work with a lot of companies and government agencies and um, non whatever, just like uh, organizations on their communication. This is just a nice like tool for seeing what it would look like. It's, it's open AI, it's GPT-4, so it's not secure. So you shouldn't put anything that's confidential in there, but it is a, it's, I, I'm surprised at how much traction it's gotten. And we'll put that in the notes too. It's free, it's up there. But so when you ask about AI, I think two things. I think one, whoever is writing, and AI right now is going to increasingly help us write. We want it to be easy for people to, humans to read on the other side. And in that case, the principles are the principles, whether whoever the author is. And in the meantime, we've demonstrated, like it's really easy for these LLMs to learn how to write this way. They, they don't currently, but they will soon, I'm sure. Uh, and go, our website, we have a little tool. We also have a Chrome extension and a wide range of stuff. So, so how do you do that? Do you tell the AI what your objective is? Like to look important, to blow away with facts, to make it as short as possible? How does it know what you want it to do? Oh my God, what, what is, what's the phrase that the AI people use? Interpretability. <laughs> I don't know how it does it, but the... Uh, but one thing that it's like, it's in, I mean, it's all, this is all going to be age. This is all going to age in like oh, six months. They'll be like, why are they talking about it that way? Since the, <laughs> you know, I don't even listen to podcasts anymore. I just get a download from <laughs> my, my AI overlord. The, um, the one thing like the real, like we, we teach it the principles that are on this checklist. Yeah. And then we give it feedback on, on how to, how to how they apply with regards to in this case email and then we give it a bunch of examples to sort of so it can sort of like learn what they look like applied and one of these that like you'll see one of the kind of subtle principles under design for navigation which is one of the principles we haven't talked about but it's one of the principles they like make this basically make it skimmable add headings and things like that um one of them is put similar ideas next to each other and separate dissimilar ideas Right, which is like uh, because it's just easier for people to consume in in a single section of the text, and these LLMs, like we give it, we tell it that we train it on the principles, we show some examples, and then if you put test emails in there, and this is only email, like we're talking with other organizations about making versions for you know reports or proposals or sales pitches or whatever, but like this is for email, and you send them an email where it's like uh, Ben and Cameron. So much fun on the podcast. Uh, I love your backgrounds. Uh, when we were talking, I could see your backgrounds. And then two paragraphs about the substance of what we talked about. And then at the end, I'm like, I especially like the sign. Both of you have rational reminder in the background so we can remember the name of the podcast while we're talking. It's great. Best or warm affection and hugs, whatever, <laughs> Todd. And, uh, and then the LLM pulls out that last part, you know, because I said in the very beginning, like, loved your backgrounds. And then the end, I ended with, like, you guys said rational reminder in the background. It puts them together. Like, it's really cool. Mm -hmm. Like, it's like, oh, those are related ideas. They should be next to each other. Wow. <laughs> yeah, that's crazy. Yeah, it's I, fun. I, I, I want to ask, so I, 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 I think I can guess the answer to the question, but I want to ask it anyway, just with the context you have, with the, the research that you've done on this and the work you've done with companies and governments, the answer is probably obvious, but I'm going to ask it. How important is 
good writing? I, I would start answering that question by making a distinction between good writing and effective writing. Okay. And good writing is what we have been taught. We've been taught mm. how to write well. Uh, and effective writing is what we've been talking about. Writing that is easy for readers to consume, understand, and respond to. Uh, and they're different. So just, just want like, they are different and we've never been taught how to write effectively. That said, how important is effective writing? I mean, it depends on your context. It, we, if you're, you know, you're, I work with a private equity fund that, um, that pitches companies uh, and, and, and LPs on things. And, you know, you can go from a response rate of X to a response rate of two X and, mm. you know, the ROI on that's really high. Uh, you can, I work with, uh, the federal government in the United States, where we have the Department of Health and Human Services, they're rewriting their notices of funding opportunity, which basically they're RFPs. Mm -hmm. uh, and the their concern is that our, the RFPs are so complex that New York City, LA, and Chicago have the infrastructure to respond to them. But smaller cities like, like Omaha and Buffalo don't. And they, they, but they want all, everyone to be able to use it. And so they're, they're really interested in not, you know, not the ROI from a like LP investment standpoint, but instead the ROI of like, how do we make our federal funding for grants to like remove lead from the housing of low income households with small children everywhere and not just in the big cities that have the infrastructure. Right. So like, you know, the, depends on your problem, but the, the payoff can be the payoff can be high because we you know we don't really tend to write with centering the reader the realizing that like the reader is going to skim us and it is not enough to just be clear and complete amazing todd your book writing for busy readers communicate more effectively in the real world is excellent it's been so great to have you join us yeah, this was fun. I, I, I want to end with just the repeating what I've said before. The goal is that everyone add a round of editing to themselves where they ask themselves, how do I make it easier for the reader? Because the easier we make it for the reader, the more effective we will be in achieving our goals. And it's also just kinder to them. Thanks for having me, guys. Well, awesome. Thanks, Todd. Todd was great. It's so much fun to learn interesting topics from somebody like that mm -hmm. uh, kick it off Ben let's talk about the upcoming webinar okay so we've got an upcoming PWL webinar it's on March 8th at noon Eastern time the topic is women's wealth investing basics for women and this is hosted by Melissa Lorson and Kelly Thomas from PWL it's gonna be an interactive and as always educational session uh, they're gonna cover women as investors which is a topic that I've seen their notes on, and it's got it's got some really, and th this is why it's women's wealth. The rest of the topics are pretty de gender neutral. Uh, but they've got some really interesting uh, things specific to women to think about from a financial planning and uh, an investing perspective. Uh, and then they've got uh, what to know you be before you get started. These are more, all more gender neutral. Uh, why you should invest, what is a stock, what is a bond, active versus passive funds, and how to get started. I think it'll be a really good session um, for women, definitely, but lots of universally interesting topics for uh, for anyone. And what's really cool about how they operate these is they are legitimately interactive. There's tools inside of it that really is engaging, so they do a great job at these events. Yeah, they are good. Okay, reading challenge update. There's 105 active readers in the challenge that have... Uh, read 376 books so far this year. You can still lots of time to join the 24 and 24 challenge. You can uh, register. Uh, there's a link on our rashreminder.ca website. Speaking of books, I don't know if you got yours yet, Ben. I don't think so. The 20th anniversary, I'm holding it up for the YouTube viewers, the 20th anniversary of Index Funds, the 12-step recovery program for active investors by our good friend Mark Hebner who was a guest, uh, past guest on episode 116. Mark was also in the movie, uh, the Errol Morris film, Tune Out the Noise. This book is much smaller. Remember the original one was huge and mm -hmm. extremely heavy. So he's condensed it down, beautifully done, full of formula charts, tables, quotes, QR codes, 
forwards by uh, Harry Markowitz, quotes from, or sorry, um, endorsing quotes from Burt Malkiel, John Bogle, David Booth, Paul Samuelson, beautifully done, his own artwork in it. So kudos to Mark. It's available everywhere now, including on Kindle. Uh, reviews. We had a few reviews here. Why don't you kick it off? All right. Daniel X. Martin from Great Britain says, Best evidence-based financial podcast. Been an avid listener for a while now, and the episodes being released keep getting better and better. Thank you both for your hard work. Keep fighting the good fight. Much appreciated from a UK-based financial planner. And this next one will show you that we don't cherry-pick the reviews. <laughs> EGA one two three four dollar sign from the United States gave us a one star and said fall from grace. It was disgraceful of this podcast to do a hit piece on one person without involving the other side. I've been a fan of this podcast, but the episode on Ray Dalio has significantly dented the reputation, at least in my eyes. Sorry to hear that. BGA one two three four dollar sign. <laughs> I wonder if it did more damage to our reputation or Ray Dalio's. Oh, I'm probably not helping. I'm probably not helping the situation. You're probably not helping. <laughs> no. Just take the feedback. <laughs> Feedback's a gift, Ben. Remember that. Yeah, it is. Wait, we we would have Ray Dalio on. I, I'll, maybe I'll ask him. As if he's actually going to read my email, but maybe I'll <laughs> ask him. I, I would genuinely have him on. For sure. Um, but to, to, we, to, to VGA's point, we have not asked... Ray Dalio to come on and defend himself. We should probably do that. Uh, Jess Deland from the United States of America. Uh, oh. He was referring to the, the, the episode we had with uh, the, the retirement dream team. Oh, yeah. David yeah, yeah, Blanchett, yeah, Wade Found, Michael Fickey. That's what he's referring to in these comments. I see. The title of the review is January 25th, 2024. Yep. Oh, I see. You put a note in there explaining this. I didn't yep. read the note. <laughs> You're, you're, you're uh, disclosing our secrets, the mystery. Yeah. So uh, they, they said that that was one of the most interesting guest lineups you've had. I watched it on YouTube, shared with a couple of friends, did rewinds because some topics were so important. I'm a Florida listener. That was a great episode. Oh. It's, been, it's been one of our most viewed episodes in, in recent history. Those guys are so good. So good. So good. I yeah. uh, heard from some interesting people lately. I had a great conversation with Florian, who is a – Maybe this one, a medical student or just became a doctor in Quebec who's an avid listener, reached out to talk about possibly helping some of his family and how much he's enjoying the Money Scope podcast. Wow. Shout out to Money Scope. Man, I'm a huge biased, but a huge fan. I think you guys are doing great, as I say every time. So thanks to Florian for reaching out. On LinkedIn, heard from Tom in New York City. Love the podcast. Great, thoughtful content. I recommend it to everyone. Cheers. And uh, he started to read Rob Copeland's book, The Fund, and his favorite episode is the Chris Hatfield episode. Also heard from Jeff and talked to Jeff in Calgary, who I think has a very bright future in the industry. He's an avid listener and reached out to talk about his career. Then you and I both received an email from Cameron in Sydney, Australia. He wanted to thank us for the podcast and describe the impact, and it's so well put, the email he sent us, that the impact has had on his own money habits and also on his career choices. And I have a call set with him in a couple of weeks. So it's super fun to meet people like that. Upcoming There's guest. Sorry, oh, I ben. did. There, in, the, uh, in the Rational Miner community, there, uh, there was a milestone reached, which is that there, there's one big topic called this market is weird. And it, it just became the topic where people congregated to sort of chat about stuff day to day. So it's not a dedicated topic that people discuss one thing. It's just like, this ongoing dialogue, um, which is always entertaining to read, but it reached 10,000 uh, replies, wow. which is the limit in discourse. Oh, no. And so the topic was closed and a new one, This Mark is Weird Part 2, was created. And it's now up to uh, only only 42 replies, but I'm sure I'm sure it'll eventually get to 10,000 as well. The community cool. has been very, very active, though. Lots of really good discussions. Upcoming guests. Next week, Adam Alters here, author of the book Anatomy of a Breakthrough. What a phenomenal. Oh, my gosh. That was mm -hmm. such a good conversation. Mm -hmm. In three weeks' time, uh, leadership coach. This will be a very different episode. 
Uh, Randall Stutman is going to be joining us. He founded the firm Admire Leadership, which we've talked about in the past. I'm a bit of a junkie, so it's a bit of a self-indulgent topic, but I think people will enjoy it. Randall is amazing. Then in four weeks, Ryan Hawk and Brooke Cups will be here. They have a new book coming out, The Score That Matters. Uh, Ryan is the host of the long-running weekly podcast, The Learning Leader Show, which I'm a regular listener of. Why don't you queue up the question? We have a very important question, Ben, for listeners. Okay, sure. So we did this. We did a live meetup in Toronto last year, and there were a ton of people there. How many people were there? Do you know? 40, 50, something like yeah, that. at least. And people cycled through throughout the, throughout the evening. Anyway, we talked to mm-hmm. a bunch of people. Was, that was True. That was enjoyable, as much as I joke about not liking to leave my house and stuff like that. It was great to meet a bunch of people that listen to our podcast. One of the comments that we got there from a few people was that we should do more like premium merch. Like people like to rep RR and they would like to rep it with premium stuff. Because we, we get whatever, reasonable quality stuff, but like cheap, you know, printed t-shirts and things like that. Yeah. And so we got this feedback that you guys should do just like real high quality merch and people will, will buy it. So that's our question. If we did like a Rational Reminder vest, a Patagonia vest, for example, Rational Reminder branded, would people buy it? Do we know what the price point is, roughly? 175 to 200 and we take no spread on that. So this is just a cost flow through. So it'd be I'd in buy that, one that personally. Zone. I would, I I, would buy I, one. I mean, I love them. I'm a huge Patagonia fan. Um, okay, so that's the question for listeners. If we make a RR branded, Rational Reminder branded Patagonia vest would people pay 175 to 200 dollars for it and i think angela's angelica's going to set up a thing in the community to respond yeah we we'll probably do a poll in there poll in there or if you have an opinion drop us a note we're easy to find i'll buy one i'll tell you that right now <laughs> uh anything up with any news you want to share about the money scope uh money scope continues to do well people seem to be really enjoying it uh, we did an episode a uh, couple weeks ago, I think, when this when this episode comes out. We called it an, an intermission, but we just took a break to kind of talk about the podcast because unlike Rash Reminder, we don't have really a chat at the beginning or at the end. There's no after show. So we just took a break from regular content and talked about how things are going. Um, one of the things we talked about was the scope theme. Mark and I just thought this was like the smartest thing ever to <laughs> call it the money scope and to have the sounds of a scope between the introduction and the body of the episode. Uh, we've got mixed feedback on that. And we talked about that on in our intermission episode and then people chimed in with more mixed feedback. So I don't know, we'll probably leave it to be honest with you because we both like it. And listeners, some people say like, yeah, it's really off-putting. But then some people say, I absolutely love it. So, I, <laughs> so what do you do with that? Yeah, I don't know. Um, and some, someone made the interesting comment that it's it gives it, like, character that you're... Yeah. Ca- the, the type of character that will be decreasingly present in content as AI does more of the work. I thought that was a really interesting comment. Um, like, we've seen some AI-generated videos that are... You can barely tell the difference between that and a real uh, a real video. And so this person's comment on YouTube was that... I think it was on YouTube was that character like that is just going to be, it'll uh, separate real content from AI-generated yeah. content. Um, the, the next few episodes, um, for a bit, at the end of the series it gets less niche, I guess, but the next few episodes are going to get pretty Canadian account type and tax and Canadian corporation planning heavy. Uh, we've, we've spent a ton of time preparing the episode on how to compensate yourself from a corporation. So if you have a corporation in Canada, how should you pay yourself? How should you get money out of the corporation? Um, a lot's gone into that. And it's being reviewed now by a couple of other financial planners and a couple of accountants because it's such a complex topic. But there's like, I don't know, three or four major common myths that are getting busted in that episode. It's going to be a good one. To have that done to the quality that both the two of you were doing it in, in one spot, is so beneficial. 
as opposed to little random snippets and opinions. Like you're, you're bringing it together so thoughtfully. And again, to have it reviewed by, by some of our, our peers and friends is just incredible, I think. Yeah. Yeah, we did that for one, I think, of the earlier episodes. Because a lot of it's relatively basic. Like for Mark and I to talk about the basics of investing, we didn't feel like we needed anybody to review that. Yep. But for how to compensate yourself from a corporation or even for the account types episode, it's complex enough that we just we, we asked um, peers to to look over it. So it's not peer reviewed in the sense that it was a formal peer review process. It wasn't a blind peer review, but but we did ask people with expertise on these topics to yep. review the content. Anything new with the uh, your YouTube channel? Uh, no, I've been trying to post on there more. I, I haven't posted recently because I've been busy with uh, Money Scope and Rational Reminder and doing other Our day job. research <laughs> stuff. Yep. Any great I'll, content I'll, I'll, you've, you've seen lately or anything great you've read lately? Um, no. I've been listening to the, a book about Bitcoin that Mark told me to to uh to look at that's been uh i won't name the book yet because i don't know if i have an opinion on it but it's been interesting to read to say the least oh yeah i'm supposed to mention this actually a special guest i alluded to on twitter a couple weeks ago i've been reading scott galloway's book oh yeah the algebra of wealth so scott galloway is going to be a guest coming up in a few weeks super excited about that Nice. Yeah, I'm, I'm an avid listener of his his uh, Prop G pod. And uh, I, I the book is really interesting. I mean, if you know Scott, he's a very um, articulate speaker, very passionate about his opinions and, and entertaining for me to listen to. Somewhat polarizing, I get that. So some people, I realize, I hear the comments coming already, are going to disagree with me on this, and that, that's totally okay. But the book is the book is really well done. He's going to be a great guest. It'll be a lot of fun hmm. too. So. Something I've I was thinking about, like why I haven't not been reading much stuff recently or watching stuff. I, I, I've been uh, I started doing something new this year. Um, I've got two papers on the go right now with people who are um, financial planners who do not work at PWL. Uh, so external collaborations. So I've got one paper that's almost done on infinite banking, the idea of shoveling all your money into a permanent insurance policy and borrowing against it instead of using the more traditional approach to saving and, and investing. So that, that, that's been an interesting project. And then I've got another paper on the go uh, about uh, Canada Pension Plan, the, the CPP, that we, we talked about this in the recent podcast episode as well, but uh, for a business owner who can choose whether to pay themselves salary, which requires paying into CPP, or paying themselves dividends, which does not, uh, just looking at that that problem from an angle that, as far as I know, nobody has looked at before. So both of those are with guys that work at other other firms, but that's been a really uh, a really interesting process to collaborate with with new people. And fun. They're good guys. Super fun. Yeah, that's the thing. And I'm learning... A ton. It's uh, something that I'm going to continue doing, collaborating with, uh, collaborating with other people. Love it. As always, you can reach us uh, online, LinkedIn, X, it's in- Twitter. Man, come on. I'm trying X. to be. I'm trying to be progressive here. Oh, maybe I'm going to take a shower now. <laughs> no, some people. So many people say X, formerly Twitter. Okay, is Twitter or is it X? I'm trying to be. I still. Uh, I. I I don't know. Maybe I'm just a dinosaur. I, I refuse. <laughs> I refuse to call it X. Yeah. So ridiculous. We're meeting a lot of people through there, though. A lot of people are are using the Calendly link in uh, Mark's bio, your bio, my bio. Oh yeah. And booking directly to meet advisors. Yeah, it's interesting. It's a whole new world. Yep. It's pretty cool. Love to hear it. Okay, everybody. As always, thanks for listening. Have a great week.